Great Sunday, everyone, and we welcome everyone who are joining us today for our online live streaming. And may this be a time of worship, reflection, and prayer, and we invite the Holy Spirit in the midst of us through our call to worship from Psalms chapter 66, verses 8 to 20. All of you people, come praise our God. Let his praises be heard. God protects us from the death and keeps us steady. Our God, you tested us just as silver is tested. You trapped us in the net and gave us heavy burdens. You sent war chariots to crush our skulls. We traveled through fire and through floods, but you brought us to a land of plenty. I will bring sacrifices into your house, my God, and I will do what I promised when I was in trouble. I will sacrifice my best sheep and offer bulls and goats on your altar. All who worship God, come here and listen. God has done for me. I prayed to the Lord and I praised him. If my thoughts had been sinful, he would have refused to hear me. But God did listen and answered in my prayer. Let's praise God. He listened when I pray and he is always kind. Let us worship our Lord. wondrous mystery in the dawning of the king. I sing. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the king. In a stream of heaven's praises robbed in frail humanity. In a
Jesus Christ to meet with you, to greet you in our being. In the unity, we, we worship you no matter where we are. For this beautiful day, open our heart and mind so that we can sense you within us. We lift up our time, our worship, our singing, our praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. sisters, let's give some time to thank Jesus. No matter where you are, speak it out. Thank you everything. Thank you Jesus for this great love. Jesus, we praise you, we worship you, we adore you. Thank you for this great and sacrificial love on the cross. That you live, you died, you rose again on high. You opened the way for the world to live again, for us to live again. We know sometimes we question the things around us. We question your faithfulness. We question ourselves. We think we're not good enough. You create us in your image. And you are our provider. You are our prince of peace. You are our refuge, a cornerstone.
every time in the world. You can always count on Him. And you said, Chris, you can count, cast all our worries, our anxieties to you because you care for us. He loves us. And this love manifests when you came to us, came to this world. Jesus, thank you for this great love. All our glory, all the glory, all the praises, we deserve it. And we give it to you. Give it to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's sing again this song. Because Jesus is our Savior, our Redeemer. Let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. And save us from the time of trial. And deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. Praise God and thank you for uh, all your wonderful <laughs> leadership and uh, hard work behind the scene musicians and team. Um, I, it's such a blessing to, um, to be part of the on-site preparation of worship and uh, we get to see the behind the scene and how we wish, how I wish that um, we can all get back together in the same roof together to worship in one house. Uh, last week, a few weeks, we've been uh, hinting and uh, uh, previewing the possibility of reopening uh, our service, on-site service, for next Sunday as we have our anniversary celebration. Now, here's some update. <laughs> Keep watching and checking, okay? Uh, 
there is a possibility, most likely, probably, perhaps, maybe we won't be able to come together, depending on how the situation unfolds. But keep watching, uh, checking our, our updates, and um, we'll uh, have to come up with a decision uh, very, very, very soon, uh, while we're still preparing for uh, the green light. So with that, uh, let's now go to the video notice to look at the rest of what's going on. Welcome to the Methodist International Church. Here are today's notices. The first reading today is from two excerpts taken from the book of 1 Peter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ, and to be sprinkled with his blood. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that was to be yours made careful search and inquiry, inquiring about the person or time that the spirit of Christ within them indicated when it testified in advance to the sufferings destined for Christ and the subsequent glory. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you, in regard to the things that have now been announced to you through those who brought you good news by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. You have been born anew, not of perishable but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. That word is the good news that was announced to you. For the time has come for judgment to begin with the household of God. If it begins with us, what will be the end for those who do not obey the gospel of God? For the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution, whether of the emperors as supreme or of the governors as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. Slaves, 
accept the authority of your masters with all deference, not only to those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. Wives, in the same way, accept the authority of your husbands. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. Amen. The second reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 44 to 53. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I'm sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. 
and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. We, we, we've been on a series called um, The People of God's Kingdom. 
uh, exploring the questions of who we are, uh, our identity as a people, and how it relates to uh, church membership. Uh, we've preached on uh, how as God's people um, and, and as member of the church, uh, we are born again uh, to hope again and to receive spiritual inheritance. Uh, a few weeks ago, Ross preached about what it means to be holy and sanctified and to live in fear, godly fear. Uh, and uh, Reverend Eden also preached on how we are saved and secure as God's people because of God's motherly, tendering comfort and care last week. So it's a lot. So today uh, we're going to begin to begin to wrap up the series because uh, next week will be the last. And today we will talk about um, something a bit different. Gospel obedience. It's a unique type of obedience that comes from the gospel. It's a key quality in God's people and in the church. It's a characteristic of you know, all the members of people who come to Christ. And um, however, it is something that we're easily confused with the typical type of obedience that we know. And it is something that rarely preached on, but we need to hear more, especially in a world so polarized or divided on the notion of authority. Recently, I had a chat with a young Christian brother, a new friend I made when I was in Australia, and um, he, knew, he knows that I'm a pastor, and so uh, he quickly asked me what my view is on the whole LGBTI thing, um, and uh, it, has, it has become the biggest issue facing his church now, if not just the leadership. Now, some of you know, um, the Marriage Amendment Act uh, in, it got passed in 2017 uh, in December, on December 7th, 2017, in the uh, Australian Parliament. And since then, uh, same-sex marriage has been legalized for that country, and as well, it has become a dividing issue in the Church of Australia. And even within the Methodist Church, uh, we are going through that too. And now, I realized at that moment, I, find, uh, I found myself a bit rusty on the topic in how to you know, share my view in counseling. And I, I told him, you know, because in Hong Kong, we've been confronted with not so much by the marriage at Manan Bill, but the extradition bill. You know, it's the protests and the police and the, you know, umbrellas and tear gas that we have been dealing with. And like Reverend Eden mentioned a few weeks ago, and, and uh, in subsequent week, you know, it's, you know this, this virus seems like um, something of a, a grace that gives us a break from all that, and now everything seems to be coming back. So as I was preparing this sermon with this text that we've read um, about authority and obedience, and then on Thursday this week as I was driving back to the office, Suddenly, I, you know, some flashing light caught my eye through the mirror. It's a police car. And I was like, is it after me? Uh, it was you know, f f far in the back on a different lane, and I checked my dashboard, and I was clearly under the speed limit, and so I should be okay. But in the next second, it was cruising right next to me, and you know, I heard some noise through the window, and I have to turn down my um, uh, radio, my... my uh, music, and uh, until I hear WH2719 pull over now, <laughs> oh no, it's me. <laughs> Surely I wasn't speeding, so why am I being pulled over? And I must say, with all that, you know, it's been shown on media, verified or not, nowadays one just can't seem to, uh, to know or to, to doubt, you know, what kind of treatment you may get from the police anymore. No judgment there, I just confessing my feeling. And, and I looked at myself, I was wearing a black shirt. <laughs> I had my face mask on. So my heart started to pump a little bit. So, well, I stopped and rolled down my window and then the officer came up and said, you know, ID, driver license and your insurance, please. I went, okay, okay, you know, very compliant. And then I asked in the most polite terms and tone and said, ah, sir. <laughs> you know, in, in Cantonese, of course, may I ask, you know, what's, what's going on? So now it's just about my vehicle license. It's expired. <laughs> I've totally forgot to renew. Woo! <laughs> and then the word came, you know, haven't you read? 
accept the authority of every human institution faster. <laughs> but at that moment, you know, I felt God was also asking me, but is that gospel obedience? Yeah, surely, you know, you've got to pay the tickets and renew the license, but is that what it means to be obeying the gospel? Or gospel obedience means, uh, as Peter says in this passage, of course, this is just not, you know, that, that's not <laughs> gospel obedience, that's just common sense. You just have to abide with your, uh, the law of your city. And um, so, gospel obedience, what is it? Why obey? And where, where does this idea come from? Now, first of all, what is gospel obedience? Right at the start, in chapter 1, verse 2, uh, Apostle, Paul, uh, uh, Apostle Peter calls the exile a people who have been chosen and destined to be obedient. A people who have been chosen and destined to be obedient to Jesus. No, no, notice, it is not because they have been obedient first and therefore they have been chosen. No, 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 no. It's either, is it because they must be obeyed in order to be chosen? No, 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 no. They have already been chosen for the purpose of obedience. So gospel obedience is a unique kind of obedience that actually comes from obedience first to the gospel. Is it obedience that arise or flow out of an obedience to Jesus first and foremost? Growing up in a you know, Asian Chinese you know, authoritarian culture myself, you know, I'm very familiar with what I like to call a moralistic obedience or religious obedience. You know, being compliant, <laughs> listen to the teacher, be the nice boy, uh, traditional, conservative, filial, and pious, and very Confucian. It says, you know, in order to be accepted. You must obey. In order to belong, you must be compliant. So I obeyed, therefore I deserve to be accepted. That's moralistic obedience. You know, I hated it because you know, it's driven by so much self-righteousness and, and guilt and shame and pride and all that. And it breeds ego and glory and shame and anger and anxiety within myself. I grew up a very anxious boy and very much still so now. But, you know, as much as I hate it and I don't want to be, be like that, you know, I, I'm also deeply shaped by this sort of obedience myself. No matter how hard I try to avoid it, I have also become, you know, more self-righteous than I realize and more moralistic than I like to admit. But on the other hand, I, you know, when I lived in the U.S., I experienced something of the opposite end of the spectrum that says everyone should be free to find their true self and meaning in life. Very different. You know, it's about self-discovery and self-actualization, you know, redeeming yourself and you know, liberating yourself. It's about self-salvation and determination, you know, it's self-everything. And... It says that it's often in the struggle to resist and overcome that, yeah, anything that comes in the way of that journey of everything, self-everything. That is what gives one's identity and meaning and significance in life. And uh, obedience is almost completely out of the picture. Because deep down, this says that, you know, I don't really have to obey anyone or anything because I'm a free, autonomous individual. I am my law and I am my own judge. Uh, this is, you know, what the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor calls you know, expressive individualism. It's all about expressing and finding yourself. But in the most extreme case, this is what I believe uh, Apostle Peter called in, verse, uh, in chapter 4, verse 3, a kind of lawless freedom, a lawlessness. So after I became Christian, after I came to Christ, or rather, <laughs> Christ came to me, I began to know a little bit more about this gospel obedience. And gospel obedience is neither moralistic religious obedience 
nor this sort of unchecked lawless freedom. It's something entirely different. And it says this. By the costly obedience of Jesus to the Father, for my sake and on my behalf, I've been forgiven and set free. And because of what he did, because of the costly obedience that he offered, I'm already belong. Therefore, I obey him. Gospel obedience is a unique kind of obedience that comes from that gospel. You know, it's the fruit of the gospel. It's, it, it almost is the first aspect of that fruit. And that will continue to grow throughout the whole of Christian life. And so that's gospel obedience in general. But here, there's something more specific. In 1 Peter, in the second excerpt that we heard uh, in the later part, uh, there's a particular kind of gospel obedience here that Peter is calling the first century Christians to. It's a particular kind of fruit to look for under their set of trials and persecutions and circumstances. And he says this, you know, to the exiles and aliens, accept the authority of every human institution, uh, to the politically persecuted, accept the authority of the emperor and, uh, and the governors, the slaves, accept the authority of your Masters and wives accept the authority of the husband and young people in the church accept the authorities of the elder. Peter is saying to them, even though those human institutions and people in positions of power are unjust, unworthy, or even abusive under the, that time, in that time, even they are like that. But for the Lord's sake, suffer it. Accept your given situation. Endure it for the witnessing of the gospel. So, it's a particular obedience. Even when those authorities, it's not saying, like, yeah, you need to pay your traffic ticket or your, no, 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 no. It's like when the authorities are not doing what is right. Peter is saying, even then, submit to them because of the Lord because of what, what, what Jesus is calling them to, as Peter discerned. So, now, you may find this gospel obedience is a very strange combination of words. Because the gospel, the word gospel simply means good news, I think many of us know, and one might wonder, why is this good news something to be obeyed? You know, I've heard uh, believing the gospel, or faith in the gospel, or gospel freedom, but gospel obedience, <laughs> obeying the gospel, is it, it sounds a bit strange. And first of all, I didn't invent it. You know, it's Apostle Peter uh, who said it, and we have heard it read. And in the, one of the verses, it's chapter 4, verse 7, he said, the gospel is something to be obeyed. And that, that call to obedience out of that first obedience to, to Jesus, that theme is all over this letter. So Why? Why this strange idea together? You know? Why obedience? And that leads us to the second part. So, why is the gospel something to be obeyed? And to answer that question, we have to understand what is the gospel or what is the true nature of the gospel? And this is perhaps the very first issue that confronted the early church in the earliest days of Christianity. Uh, if we get to read the book of Galatians, which, which is probably written much earlier than this uh, letters by Peter. Uh, and Paul saw Peter wasn't being in line with the truth of the gospel. They had a huge conflict in front of everyone. Paul made a big, big scene out of it. And surely there, you know, there are different ways to talk about the gospel and preach it and to express it. And there, in fact, there are an infinite number of ways, creative ways. But what does it mean? to be in line with the truth of the gospel. And I want you to know this is of absolute importance, especially when we are talking, you know, I keep hearing about revival, revival, you know, this is great thing is going to happen. The word gospel and the words like, you know, evangelical, you know, which is derived from the Greek euangelion, you know, they're one of those, you know, Ghibli words that we use, you know, uh, jargons that we got thrown around in the church and even by, you know, preachers. Yet it is, 
the most <laughs> important question in the whole of Christianity, and even of the whole cosmos. What is the truth of the gospel? And if we are clear on what this truth about the gospel is, then we will know why it is something to be obeyed. And what I'm going to do is, you know, which I hate, it's going to be a flyover uh, of this important topic just quickly. And I hope we'll come back and revisit this topic um, in uh, another sermon series. And here's a few things I'd like to go through. The gospel, what is the truth of the gospel? A few things, three things. The gospel is historical, it's compelling, and it's substitutionary. Now, these are big words. Just, let me just go over quickly. The gospel is historical. It is, first of all, news, not views or good advice. The gospel is good news, not good views, opinions, or good advice. What is the difference? Well, I think in this in the age of you know, the fake news and post-truth, you know, all these alternative facts and what they call constructive journalism, and uh, I think we have come to uh, be awakened to the danger and the power of news, true news or fake news, you know, of how they can change and manipulate people's behavior so much more than sound arguments and opinions. If you want the masses to change, say, how they will vote in a presidential election, or you, you, know, you spread news to change the people's perception of the reality about the candidates or the whole situation about the, you know, the country, and then you turn the vote. Views or advice, or even moral ethical advice, they are about something that might not have happened necessarily, but you, know, you, you, can, you can agree or disagree with it. But news is testimony. It reports of something that has already happened, whether you like it or not, and there's nothing you can do about it. You don't agree with testimonies. You either accept it to be true or not. And the gospel is, first of all, good news, not good advice or good views. It is pri not primarily about you know, how men should live and how the world should be conducted and governed and you know, how even how the church should be run. Or it is first of all, the gospel is first of all not about moral ethics or governance. The gospel is first of all news about what ha happened to Jesus in history and what happened to history in and because of Jesus. It's primarily about who Jesus is and what he has said and done as testified by this small group of weak, vulnerable, powerless disciples in history. And in light of his, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and the meaning of those events as explained by Jesus himself, how the whole course of human history has been changed. That is the gospel. The gospel is, first of all, not views or opinions or moral stance. It is first of all about Jesus, what he has done, who he is, what has happened in him, and what the world has gone through because of him. And therefore, it demands not agreement, but faith. You either accept all those things that are reported in the Bible to be true or not. Second, the gospel is compelling. Now, for what Peter said here in the first excerpt that you know, we, we, we heard read, the gospel is the testimony of the Holy Spirit on things which the prophets were made, uh, made careful search and inquiry, the things into which angels long to look. The gospel, in all, it's all, in all, ways, uh, all the ways it's being proclaimed and expressed and lived out in our lives, inspires a compelling curiosity. And that compelling curiosity draws the prophets of old to wonder and search for the truth in Scripture. And it attracts even the angels and the heavenly creatures in all of heaven and earth to long to behold, behold this mystery. Now, in this Easter season, as we reflected on the origins of Christianity, uh, and even the church. Uh, the good news is to the apostles, the first disciple of Jesus, 
first and foremost, those curious reports that they heard. Do you remember uh, the testimony of the, and on, on the empty tomb you know, in John 20? You know, it made Peter and the other disciples wonder what's going on. And out of that wonder, they got up and from their despair, they got up and they ran to the tomb and find out what happened and to look inside. <laughs> What's going on? And then how about the testimony of Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women? Uh, recorded in Luke 24, which says, you know, the angel announced to and reminded them, you know, Jesus is risen just as he said beforehand. And it says that the women's words seems to be idle tale that confounded the apostles. And that <laughs> led them to find out what happened. And then what about the testimony of Clippus and and the, the other disciples who were walking onto the road, uh, onto uh, to Emmaus, and you know they were at first disillusioned, they were utterly despaired. But then they encountered this mysterious stranger. To remember those words, that this stranger helped them to remember those words that Jesus spoke before his death, and how he must suffer and die, and, and their eyes were open to recognize that it was Jesus all along walking with them, opening scripture, opening their eyes, opening their hearts. It is this stranger that you know, made their heart strangely warmed while they was opening the meaning, the true meaning of scripture. And then in verse 33, it says, that same hour, that same hour, they got up, <laughs> They got up and returned to Jerusalem. You know how far that journey might be? They got up and get back to Jerusalem. But they were eager to tell, you know, this wonderful, mysterious encounter. And then, so, the gospel is compelling. It inspires a curiosity that liberates people, even from the deepest of despair. To get up and get out. You have to do something about it. Tell people about it. <laughs> in, in this coming week, you know, as we reflect on the origins of the Methodist Church, you know, the, the, the conversion of John Wesley, isn't it, isn't it that, that, that same experience happened to him? You know, when he said his heart was strangely warm or you know, that his heart was uh, burning within as he listened to uh, Luther's um, preface to the book of Ro uh, Romans in which he was talking about what really happened on the cross. What happened to Jesus? And then he said, you know, about quarter to nine. Is it right, Eden? <laughs> about quarter to nine. That hour, you know, he felt his heart strangely warm. And what happened is he got up and ran to find his brother Charles to tell him all about this wonderful experience, which Charles was in the process of writing this wonderful hymn because Charles also had a conversion experience, this wonderful experience. I think in our modern day busy lives, church lives included, you know, we're so preoccupied, so distracted, so full of agendas, and you know, we have no time or no bandwidth to follow up, to obey that compelling curiosity of the gospel. And I, I pray, you know, if there's anything about Christianity or the Bible or that made you wonder, or Christians around you living life that cause you to wonder, oh, don't dismiss that curiosity. Don't dismiss the sense of wonder that has been stirred in you. Follow it. <laughs> Obey it. So, gospel obedience. The gospel is to be obeyed because it's historical, it's compelling. Now, very quickly, the gospel is also substitutionary. Peter says in chapter 2, verse 24, that Jesus himself bore our sin in the body on the cross so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Have you ever wondered why Jesus said that so emphatically said and repeatedly said that everything written in about him must be fulfilled? Have you ever wondered why it is necessary for the Messiah to suffer, die, and rise on the third day? It, in fact, it is so important that you know, Jesus 
or repeated this earlier on in this chapter uh, to Clippers and uh, the other disciples. But was it not necessary for the Messiah to, to, to suffer? Why was it necessary? You know, the, the, the early disciples wondered why, and they look back and recall what the what other words Jesus said in light of what happened on the cross. And eventually they began to see a glimpse of what the cross really means. And it is recorded in Luke 19, verse 10 for us. Jesus once said, the Son of Man came to seek out to save the lost. That's why it is necessary. It was necessary that Jesus came and lived a life of perfect obedience on our behalf and suffered what he suffered in our stead, in our place. Because our own obedience is never enough. We don't know what to do, what to say as we sung in the hymns especially when we are threatened or oppressed by unjust as abusive power or caught in moral dilemmas or, or cornered by impossible situation. An abusive spouse, you know, a harsh, unjust, abusive boss, political leaders who praise those who do wrong and punish those who do what is right, or even within the church, Leaders and elders who themselves aren't good examples, but lord over people, especially the young. I mean, in those difficult situations, like, you know, we're so lost and, and so, so disobedient. We, we don't even know what to, do, what to obey anymore. Um, one of the ways I answer to that young brother in Australia is that, so now, the, so you, your church think, uh, the Bible says LGBT is a sin, so uh, we must speak against it. And then, uh, but now the law, the human institution has passed the law that it is legalized. So, and the Bible also said you need to obey and submit to the authority of the government. So what are you going to do? Which one to obey or disobey? In situations like this, we realize we are more lost, more confused, and don't know what to do than we ever realize. You know, when I was a child, you know, last week we celebrate Mother's Day, and you know, I spent time with Mother, and then she told me an encounter. You know, when I was a child, I got lost before, uh, once. We were, in, we were in a wet market. Uh, she was buying stuff and told me, no, don't move, don't, I'll, I'll be very quick, I'm just gonna pay. And in the next seconds, she lost me, and uh, I was, you know, talking with this other old lady in another booth, uh, having fun, uh, and, you know, and uh, whenever, she, and then eventually, she came, she find me, <laughs> and I was just having fun. <laughs> I didn't even know that I was lost. I guess, I guess that's the worst kind of being lost that you can get. You're lost, but you don't realize you're lost. Had my mother not come find me, I don't know where I would be because I don't even know that I'm lost. That's why Jesus came. That even, even when we are lost, and so lost that we don't even know, lost in our self-righteousness, lost in our journey to find ourselves, Jesus came, and he came with an extremely costly obedience on his part. So that he would come and find us, he would he search us and find us, and he bring us home. If it is necessary for my mom to come search for me, how much more it is necessary for Jesus to come search for us, even when we are lost, especially when we are lost, the whole world, and even after we became Christian, you know, I think the church doesn't just come with with this special status that somehow all of a sudden we just have all the moralities and ethics figured out in this complicated and confusing world. So, because our obedience and our discernment is so lost and even more, more lost than we could ever realize that Jesus has to come and he had to suffer and he had to obey. We often, oftentimes, we think 
Jesus, uh, his salvation on the cross is an act of sacrifice, a heroic act. But here it says, you know, the Messiah has a script. And Jesus knew it, being the true Messiah, that there's a script for his life. And he simply stick to that life, stick to the script. Even if it means it would cost him absolutely everything in order to find us. You know, no matter how, how lost we, we get lost in the mountain, you know, no matter how, how stubborn we are, as stubborn as the Mount Everest, nothing can stop him from making that journey to come and search and find and carry us and bring us home. That is the gospel. And when I think of that, that's what Jesus went through for me. There's nothing he can't ask me to do. There is nothing he can't ask me to do. And out of that obedience, and also out of that humility, I'm going to follow him. And I'm going to journey with people. And in that process, in that journey, whoever we are, we can come along. But get this, because when we get Jesus' costly obedience, we will never be the same. We will never be the same because Jesus will make demands in your life for you to change. And what that change look like, sometimes it, it, it could be the same as what Peter is asking us to do now, you know, that sort of obedience with the government and, you know, in our situations about marriage. But other times it could look very, very different. Look at the, look, we have to understand, remember what transformation that Peter himself has gone through here. How he was the one who used to carry a sword around. So when Jesus was being, was being arrested in Gethsemane, he was the one who first draw a sword to cut off someone's ear. Then in Acts chapter 5, we read that, you know, the Holy Spirit helped jailbreak Peter and John. And, and he said, you know, we must obey God and not human authorities. And now here we read, you know, submit to your human authorities, even when they are doing wrong. He become an advocate for civil obedience. What a journey and personally profound change that he has gone through. And I, 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 I know that that journey may be the same journey that we are on, but for others, it could be different. Maybe some of you are on a journey like that of William Wilberforce, you know, who wanted to be a minister, but actually God said, you know, I want you to stay in politics. I want you to work on the abolition of the slave trade. The fruit of the gospel out of this obedience to Christ is so abundant, so amazing, so creative that it brings all kind of transformation. And when we're talking about, this, you know, uh, I'm lost, right? Revival. <laughs> Revival. We've got to have this sight, this insight, uh, this knowledge of you know, what wonderful and abundant transformation of the gospel and out of this gospel obedience could bring in our lives, in all of our lives, in Hong Kong, in our family, in our marriages, in our relationship. However controversial and scandalous or, you know, confusing it might sound, Jesus will not let you get lost. Jesus keep coming to save you, to find you, carry you, and lead you back on track. I don't know what that is right now, for every single one of us, but this is what it means to be a church. This is why church membership is so important. In this journey of transformation, in this journey of gospel obedience, by practicing gospel obedience, we need to discern. And we need to have people to talk about it. Do you have people whom you can discern some of the difficult situations, confusing situations you are in? Are, you, are we one of those people whom people can feel they can let down a garden and talk about things with us? Or are we willing and able to really simply stop <laughs> and stay put as Jesus called the disciples to do right before he ascended? Right before he ascended, after Jesus explained everything to them, they finally, oh, we figure out now, you know, you're, you're the Messiah, you're for the world. Now we, we will go. We have to tell people about it. No, 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 no. Jesus said, but stay. Stay put. Stay in the city. And wait. Don't do anything. 
and wait and wait until, until, until the Spirit comes, until the Spirit of discernment comes, until there is about, I think there is a, some of us, our journey is to be, to, is about getting up and getting out of our despair. Others might be about stay, staying put and sit and resist that temptation to always uh, re, uh, resist and to change things or to change the world, even in the name of Jesus. If Jesus personally called you and called us to stop and wait, there is nothing he can't ask us to do. And you have to stop. So this is what church membership and what being in a church means. It's not just about filling a form and transferring your status. No, it's about real fellowship, real community, personal interaction, opening up. And we journey with each other on this same journey, but a journey that might look different in different people's lives, with our different backgrounds, our different upbringing and baggages, our different aspirations about the future, the things that have uh, shaped us in the past. You know, we haven't even talked about the seismic shift of cross. I think the seismic shift is not just happening to Jesus. If you get a glimpse of what means what Jesus and the cross means in the resurrection means we are to also have this seismic shift in the way we discern, in the way we relate to discernment, in the way we relate to morality and ethics. We, the first shift, the seismic shift that brings us is what Peter called for everyone, which is humility, which is the place that you says, I, I, I don't really know exactly what Jesus is asking me to be obedient about right at this moment and oh, for this particular situation. But uh, with, with my most sincere discernment and openness to change t towards Jesus and with open, honest sharing and discernment with dear brothers and sisters, you know, this is at this point what I have discerned for me to follow. I might be wrong. I'm, I, I don't always get it right and all the time. Uh, never we, could, we, be, we, we are right all the time. But because Jesus and because of his, of his searching love, his searching grace, I'm okay to sit with the situation of uncertainty. And I'm, gonna willing, I'm willing to sit and wait and receive what he might be saying and demanding for me to obey. And I think this is the kind of practice that we need for all of us to sit, stay put, and wait. And in that waiting, we can get to hear the gospel again and again and in new wonderful ways the wonderful gospel. So, let me close. Gospel obedience is neither a moralistic or religious obedience nor unchecked lawless freedom. It says, by the costly obedience of Jesus to the Father, for my sake and on my behalf, I'm already forgiven and set free. I already belong. And therefore, I'll obey him. There's nothing he can't ask me to do. And for Peter's time, it meant that even when human institutions and people in positions of, of power are unjust and unworthy or abusive, we accept that given situation for the Lord's sake. Suffer it for Jesus. Endure it for, witness, for the witnessing of the gospel. Because that's what Jesus himself did for us. It's historical, it's true. And he was raised from it and lifted high when the disciples were simply sitting and waiting and nothing they've done and, and said had contributed to the lifting up of Jesus and his, and his ascension. It is compelling and we can obey Jesus because Jesus himself had suffered worse for us in his obedience.
when he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. He endured. Had the world been clear in its sense, and had we been obedient, he wouldn't have to come. But since we aren't, he had to come and he had to search for us to find us and carry us, even though it would mean for him an infinitely costly obedience on his part, a narrow road, the narrowest road for him to walk through. And he had to take on this destined suffering for him, but he didn't care. He obeyed. And in order, uh, because he obeyed, in order that we might be forgiven, that we might see that we are lost and let him bring us back home. Look, the father's been waiting. The angel's been watching. Everything is ready for our final homecoming celebration in the kingdom of God. Amen. We've now come to the time of intercession. Please join me in praying for the world, the church, and the people in need. Dear God, we praise you for the promise of salvation to all. We thank you that this good news, the gospel, has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And through his death and resurrection, our sins are forgiven, and we may have eternal life in him. We invite us this morning to have faith in the gospel and in Jesus Christ. Grant us faith, which leads to obedience. May we submit to your authority and comply with your requests. And by the response of faith, may the gospel come with saving power in our lives. We pray for the world which was, which was subjected to futility due to Adam's disobedience as evidence in the horrific injustice and suffering that we see daily, including the coronavirus. We ask that you will remember those who are in grief or in need of help. Restrain your hands, protect us and heal us. And in the midst of life's enigma, may the gospel of Jesus Christ, who has subjected the world to hope, Give us reason to rejoice. We pray for wisdom for all the national leaders as they seek to serve their people. We especially pray for the political and social unrest in Hong Kong. Bless the mainland China and the Hong Kong government officials, legislative counselors, and those in, ju in the judiciary and law enforcement. Instill holy fear in their heart so that they may rule with justice and love. In the midst of, contr of controversial debates, especially over the rule of Hong Kong, may your wisdom guide and your sovereignty reign, and may your counsel prevail against our foolishness and wickedness. We pray for the young generation and all others in the community who feel oppressed, angry, and victimized. Grant them discipline and endurance, for Christ also died for the unjust. Draw them close to you. May they leave judgment to our God who will vindicate. And may the power of the gospel, which is Christ, set them free. We pray for the church. We pray that we will live a life worthy of the gospel. For how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? As obedient Christians, may we imitate your holiness and Christ's humility and love. Open our eyes to see your greatness and goodness. Infuse us with a new sense of your glory. Fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we may have a heart of praise and a powerful disposition to obey God in everyday life. As the redeemed, may our lives bear witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ in good times and in bad times. 
We place our hand into yours as MIC walks into the future under your leadership. Bless the leadership team as they discern your will, reveal your heart to us, enlarge and deepen our vision, rouse up our souls and satisfy our spiritual appetite. Humble us and teach us so that we may welcome the Holy Spirit's doing in us according to his free will. For your ways are higher and wiser than ours. When we face trials along the journey, may we return to you and rest in you. May we find strength in quietness and trust, so that now and always, Jesus is our Savior, our Lord and our God. We pray for the congregation that they may grow into spiritual maturity. Reveal to those who seek you, and may they find faith in you. And wherever we are on our journey of faith, may we grow in holiness and grace, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, revive and renew your church, and through your church, the community. Finally, we pray for all those among us who are sick, in suffering, distress, financial difficulties, broken relationships, or any other difficulties that only you know. Heal them and help them in their need. May they draw comfort and strength from your special presence. With eyes of faith and love for Jesus Christ, may they rejoice in their light and momentary affliction and testify to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the glory of your name. Amen. Thank you, Cecilia. Let us all rise and sing this final hymn. Lord of all power. Let us have a moment of silence and quiet and waiting as we wait for the blessing. Lord Jesus, may your good gospel 
ring loud and clear in our, in our hearts, in the deepest of our being. May we catch just the slightest glimpse of what you have gone through for us and for me so that as we continue to live our Christian walk in MIC with all of our brothers and sisters, seekers, doubters, or the cynics and <laughs> skeptics, may you take our hand, find us, take our hand and, and bring us home wherever we are on that journey. So may the blessing of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all till Christ comes again in his full glory. <laughs>